Texas Crossroads of North America is Chapter 7, Part 2. Land, the only asset. Common to virtually all the immigrants was the hope for economic opportunity. In the American South, from whence most of them came economic opportunity, was tied up with the ownership of land for farming, ranching, and or speculating and colonizing. And Texas had plenty of land, more than 250 million acres of public domain as the Republic era began. One tr early traveler remarked that on some of the prairies, when near the middle, it resembles being on the ocean scene. The scene appears boundless. More than 26 million acres had already been granted through a hodgepodge of Spanish, Mexican, and impresario claims. But the new government was more than ready to use much of the rest as an inducement to settlers. The Constitution liberally allowed for a league of and labor. A labor, a league is approximately 4,428.4 acres. A labor is approximately 177.1 acres. For every head of household in Texas at that time at the time of independence and for one third of a labor for every single man, excluding African Americans and Indians, the Texas Congress followed up with a series of grants for new arrivals in the period from March 1836 through December 1841. The grants were generous, and the newcomers only had to live in Texas for three years to gain clear title to the land. As a further indu inducement, on January 26, 1839, the Texas Congress passed a Homestead Exemption Act to protect debtors from seizure of their homes. Although this act had its origins in the Mexican period, when the legislators of Cohia, Texas, had enacted a similar statute, it was a first in American jurisprudence, stating that each citizen or head of family was protected from the seizure of his or her homestead. Fifty acres of land or one town lot and improvements not exceeding $500 in value in the event of bankruptcy, when even homestead measure did not stimulate Enough migration in 1841, the Texas Congress authorized the president to implement another impresario contract system. The following year, colonization law stipulated that the new impresarios would receive 10 premium sections, each to be settled by 100 families. With the government holding on to alternate, alternate sections to sell after the original sections were settled, as with previous impresario efforts, the results were uneven at best. In 1841, William Peters, an English musician and businessman, established a colony in the vicinity of present-day Dallas. With the assistance of both English and American investors thrusting settlements far northward, close to the Red River, Henry F. Fisher and Richard Miller failed in their effort to induce, introduce a large number of German immigrants to Texas, but others picked up the challenge and the resulting colonies extended the western frontier into the hill country, west of San Antonio and Austin. The Republic made arrangements with Henry Castro, a French banker who tried to help the Republic gain a loan to settle Catholic Alsatian Aus families. I'm sorry in what became the Castroville area on the Medina River southwest of San Antonio. Visitors and immigrants continued to be excited by the agricultural potential of the lands they saw in traveling through the settlements. Many newcomers agreed with David Crockett, who wrote in his last letter that, I must say, as to what I have seen of Texas, it is the garden spot of the world. The best land and the best prospects for health I ever saw, and I do believe it is a fortune to any man to come here. 
There is a world of country to, here to settle. Cotton cultivation in particular was developing and with, its, with it a planter class that depended heavily on slave labor in 1845, a Texan wrote, all our land hunting seeking sugar cotton and stock farm lands, but are as much at a loss in their selection as children in a toy shop. Other opportunities. <clears throat> Merchandising have might have been lucrative field, but for the lack of cash, which complicated the exchange, merchants or traders would buy items on credit and sell them to farmers. Planters, townspeople, other, even other to other merchants, often taking crops in place of cash. Many merchants suffered because of the financial instability of the Republic. With its paper money worth only 12 cents in exchange of the U.S. dollar, and because of the global economic panic of 1837, Adolfo Stern, a merchant who had been in business in Nagadoches since 1826, would complain in May of 1842. Times have never been so hard in Texas like they are now. I have never known or the want of two bits until now. Stern also, Len, a land agent, and many like him, tried to seize the opportunities to make money in land speculation. Land agents and land lawyers brought, bought and sold and took commissions, organizing the land market in the new territories and serving as critical intermediaries. Between the Tejano elite, who owned much of the most desirable land, and those who wanted their own parcel in a well-established American tradition, speculators brought, bought up whatever lands they could in hopes of re realizing vast profits, but many bought on credit and then saw the acreage drop in value. Some of the some used the fledging towns both as objects of speculation and has as basis for it. A visitor to Houston in, in 1837 found the spirit of speculation afloat, thousands do, thousand dollars a piece. Few of the towns could be said to be flourishing, however, and some would even decline during the Republic years. By 1844, Brasario was looking distinctly run down. Texas entrepreneurs, like their government, lacked a vital trade system, stable currency, and the ability to attract outside investors. Texas is opportunity or not. Anglos and Europeans seize power. In these challenging times, those who met, those who most often found the opportunity they sought in Texas were Anglo men. Of some means from the American South, men who had previous experience with American forms of economic and or political power. They resembled in, and in many cases were the architects of the late revolution. Men who knew their way around a cotton farm and a courtroom, <clears throat> a plantation and a political office. They had migrated primarily from the lower South, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, bringing with them strong pro-slavery views. Many had experienced failure, but business reverses, lost political elections, fractured personal lives, yet they maintained a sense of unbridled optimism and entitlement. Ira Ingram of Matagorda wrote in 1834, I did not for one invade the wilderness of Texas to speculate in cents, pecans, shillings, nor yet in dollars. I come here for a fortune. In the United States, only white males could exercise whoops, exercise that ba most basic right of citizenship, the vote. Those men had absorbed the concept of manifest destiny. Although it still did not have a name, they saw themselves as representatives of a culture and race destined for greatness and inheritors of the American continent. Other Texans, whatever their location and pursuits still could expect to have at least rudimentary homes. Anglo settlers usually lived in log cabins known as dog trot cabins. 
because they were designed with a room on either side of a central dog trot breezeway. The floors were clay or dirt. Food was equally simple, beef, bacon, cornbread, coffee. Wheat flour proved so scarce throughout the period that most families relied on cornmeal instead. Raising corn, one German settler recalled, was a matter of life and death since upon it depended the existence of the colony. Others grew their own wheat. Many were happy to get a cow. As one young woman who arrived shortly after the Republic period explained to her father, for over three months we had neither a scrap of butter or a drop of milk. <clears throat> but we get nice. We got by nicely and how, oh, how wonderful it did the first cup of coffee with milk and the first piece of cornbread with butter taste to us. European men, too, found opportunities. Although most of them were new to the continent and had to adjust to American ways as well as to the presence of Mexicans and Indians, to a great extent the immigrant European groups initially stayed together, settling setting up their own small German Alsatian, Alst Irish, and French enclaves. However, the men moved about freely and engaged in farming and business along with their American counterparts. The largest <clears throat> European immigrant group by far was the Germans, whose numbers would be estimated at more than 11,600 by 1850. Germans had migrated to Texas as early as the 1820s, with the advent of industrial production and population growth, merchants and craftsmen began losing economic ground in Germany and found it increasingly expensive to maintain even a small business. And land was a powerful allure, especially after the failed German Revolution of 1848, when many political dissenters came to Texas looking for freedom. These new arrivals became known as the 48ers. The 1842 Fisher and Miller contract to bring German colonists to Texas was expanded in 1844, but the two men sold it to the, a German organization called the Adelservine, Al, Al, a society for the protection of German immigrants to, in Texas in exchange for a flat fee. The Adelsverein, a joint stock company, promised to transport sorry, call German colonists to America and then to Adelsverein lands in Texas. Because of the Fisher-Miller Fisher grant was so remote, located between the Colorado and the Llano Rivers, the Adelsverein purchased a site on the Guadalupe River close to the edge of Anglo settlement. Prince Carl of Sol Solms Brunfields, the first commissioner, commissioner general of the Adelsverein, selected a site on the Texas coast southeast of Victoria as a landing area for further colonists. It was initially called Car Carshalfen, but later took the name of the small town of Indio Indianola. Established nearby, the first colonist arrived before Prince Carl had adequately prepared Karshalfin as a staging area for the long inland journey. Already weary from the long sea voyage, the travelers now faced a wilderness trek to their Guadalupe home, homes, River home sites. As they struggled with illness, incessant rains, and ox carts constantly mirrored by in mud, the, they established the town of New Brunfels in 1845, and in 5,200 German immigrants arrived between 1844 and 1846. Prince Carl, qu quite a swath through Texas frontier society, a tireless worker in the colonization effort, he was nonetheless best remembered for his aristocratic and eccentric ways. Diarist Mary Maverick, the wife of Samuel Maverick, reported that his two attendants lifted him 
into his trousers each day and the members of his entourage wore cock feathers in their hats. Characteristics hardly destined to survive on the frontier. Following him in the role was ostrified Hans Van Moosbach, who in Texas became John O. Moosbach, and established a second center of settlement, Fredericksburg, some 60 miles northwest of New Braunfels. In the ideology of that era in America, women were to stay at home to maintain the private sphere while Anglo and Northern Europe men engaged in the business and politics of capitalistic empire building. The division of labor was reinforced by women's frequent pregnancies and in te Texas as on frontiers elsewhere by the very real work of maintaining a self-sufficient frontier home whose residents had to rely to a large extent on their own inventiveness rather than on non-existent or erratic supply networks. Yet some, yet the same frontier conditions also gave Anglo and Amer European women some autonomy. They ran farms and businesses as well as homes in the absence of sometimes frequent and prolonged of their men. They operating board, they operated, they, oh, I'm so sorry. They operated boarding houses, participated in a frontier bartering economy, hunted and harvested as need dictated, and worked to establish schools and churches. Women also had more rights under the Hispanic influence community properties laws than did their counterparts in the United States. For economic gains in a marriage belonged to both the men, the women and the men, they could ex also expect some court protection against abusive or wayward husbands, recognizing the isolation and vulnerability of many frontier wives. The 1841 Divorce Act established standards penalizing abandonment or in cruelty some lawmake, state lawmakers would follow with anti-cruelty standards said to be among the most liberal found in the antebellum South. Nonetheless, political opportunities remained off limits. Economic opportunities, meager and women, could not legally accumulate property or sell it without the permission of their husbands. If women of the increasingly dominant Anglo and European American culture faced restrictions, Members of different ethnic groups found their opportunities even more constrained. Stephen F. Austin had become convinced by the summer of 1835 that Texas should be effectively and fully Americanized, that is, settled by a population that will harmonize with their neighbors on the East in language, political principles, common origin, sympathy, and even interest. Texas must be a slave country. It is no longer a matter of doubt that destiny would not bode well for any of the racial minorities in the Republic. Increasingly, African Americans, Tejanos, and Native Americans found far more challenges than opportunities in the Republic of Texas. The African American experience. In a land of rough conditions, slaves experienced the worst. Most Texans probably would have agreed with John S. Ripford, a physician, newspaper editor, and former Texas Ranger, who believed that slavery came to the Southern men authorized by the supreme law of the land. <clears throat> the assumption in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal was not intended to include the African race or was a falsehood on its, on its face. And if ever there was a territory economically suited for slavery, surely it was the fertile bottom land along the lower Brazos and Colorado rivers of Texas. The land was ideal for cotton, but a large workforce was necessary to till the huge acreage. And for most Texians, that workforce had to be black. William Bollart, who surveyed the Texas coast for the British Admiralty, stated that the, stated the commonly held but mistaken belief that the climate in Texas, especially along the riverbanks <clears throat> in southeast Texas, 
was too harsh for white people to perform the hard work necessary to raise cotton or sugar. So the number of slaves in Texas increased rapidly. There were no actual accounts on until the census of 1848 after Texas joined the Union, but all indications that are that the number of slaves more than doubled to perhaps as many as 11,323 by 1840 to, and to 23,624 in 1845. Most Texas slaves arrived with their masters, although a fair number were brought in by slave traders from other states, and a few came via the African trade. Although it was universally outlawed by then, including in the Texas Constitution, whereas most slaves in the southern states lived in, on large plantations, in Texas most lived in small, on small isolated farms. Even in 1860, more than half of these slave owners in Texas held four slaves or fewer, with only 1.5% claiming to own more than 50. Of course, slaves lived the most circumscribed of lives. William Fairfax Gray recalled that some of the slave homes he saw in the midst of a chilling norther in 1837 were more open than the log stables in Virginia. But rough living conditions were not all faced. The Republic of Texas government meted out harsh punishments for any crimes or even perceived crimes committed by slaves, insulting or abusive language directed at a white person earned 25 to 100 lashes. White owners could hire out slaves at will and controlled all their actions as it was forbidden for anyone to buy something from a slave without written permission from his, his or her master. There were harsh penalties, too, for anyone harboring an escaped slave or in any way encouraging or abetting for his or her, his or her escape, although th that did not prevent slaves from running away. Many to Mexico, which had outlawed slavery in 1829. Marriage between African Americans and whites was simply against the law. And the few liberties a slave might enjoy depended on, upon the temperament of his or her owner. Would the owner, for example, allow the slave to marry someone on a neighboring plantation or even to visit him or her? Even under re relatively lenient master, Slaves could not choose their own marriage partners, learn to read, or escape arbitrary punishment, and there was no guarantee that their families would remain intact, for the owner could choose, for whatever reason, to sell one or more of them. Free African Americans were restricted as well. The punitive legal codes that applied to slaves also applied to them and the Constitution of 1836 required them to receive special permission to live in the Republic. In 1837, Congress qualified this requirement allowing those in Texas at the time of independence, approximately 150 people, to remain in the Republic. One of those affected by the laws was Samuel McCullough, Jr., who had fought in the Revolution as a member of the Matagor Matagorda Volunteer Company after passage of the 1836 law. He had petitioned for citizenship and land grants. The 1837 law had automatically granted him citizenship, but left his land grant request in limbo. In 1840, Congress again revered its, reversed itself, passing a law barring the immigration of free blacks to Texas and stipulating that all free men and women must leave within two years or be sold into slavery. Although this draconian plan was not fully implemented, for example, McCullough and four relatives won exemption. Free African Americans faced an uncertain existence at best. While the abolitionist movement gained strength, Nationally, there were few active abolitionists in Texas. 
One of the few was St Stephen Pearl Andrews, a Houston lawyer and a real estate developer who argued that slavery was bad for economic development. He suggested that money be raised to purchase the slave's freedom, thereby abolishing slavery in the Republic, and even made a trip to Britain in 1843 in an attempt to raise money. the money. The effort failed when Ashbel Smith, the Texan charge d'affaires in London, denounced it. Many slaveholders blamed Andrews for stirring up trouble among the slaves, and that same year mobbed his home, forcing him to flee the state. The lives of African Americans in Texas reflected the long-lasting effects of the slave system in the South. Blacks coming to Texas, usually th through no choice of their own, knew all too well the ways in which their lives could and would be limited. In the Republic era, however, many Tejanas were just beginning to comprehend the implications of the growing Anglo presence for their own future. The Tejano experience. Immediately after the revolution, Tejanos were push, pushed, prodded, and deprived of opportunity in a ver ver variety of ways. Members of the Tejano elite who had worked with Anglo leaders were increasingly excluded from or moved to the margins of the developing power structure of the Republic. The cooperative spirit that had seen Jose Antonio Navarro and Jose Francisco Ruiz as member, members of the con convention to establish a government <clears throat> and Lorenzo de Zavala named the first vice president of the Republic fell apart. Tejano settlers near the Anglo colonies often found themselves their homes and their livestock targeted by former soldiers who were better, bitter towards Mexicans. It did not matter whether the Tejanos had actively added the revolutionary effort, remained loyal to the Mexican government, or maintained their neutrality. Many were driven from their homes, particularly those who lived near the Austin and DeWitt colonies and in the Nagadoche area. As immigrants swarmed into accessible lands with little or no regard for Mexican land titles, Juan Seguin, one of the heroes of the revolution and mayor of San Antonio in 1840-42, to recalled that the American straggling adventure, adventurers were already beginning to work their dark intrigues against the native farm families whose only crime was the, that they owned large tracts of land and desirable pro property. The area between the Rio Grande and the Nuasis was a disputed territory that soon became a no man's land. While claimed by both Mexico and Texas, most of the area was in fact dominated by various Indian tribes except for the relatively intact Mexican enclaves such as Laredo which was still considered a part of the Mexican state of Tamaulipas, even though it was on the east side of the Rio Grande, em emboldened by a per pernicious decree that declared Mexican livestock public property. Former Texas soldiers raided south of the Nuasis and took cattle belonging to, the, to Mexican residents many of whom had sought refuge in the towns along the Rio Grande during the revolution. Part of the East in Nagadoches, tensions between Tejanos and Anglos continued after the revolution. By the end of the war, immigrants from the United States decisively outnumbered Tejanos residents and showed little interest in or respect for Mexican social and political structures and culture. Tired of the intimidation, some Tejano residents rallied around the Vic Vicente Cordova, the Nagadoches area landowner and former Alca alcalde and militia commander who had opposed independence for Texas, encouraged by General Vic Vicente Filosolo, Filosolo, the Mexican commander at Matamoros in August 1838, Cordova rallied several 
hundred followers from the local Tejanos and Indians from different tribes and conducted raids along the upper Trinity River on land claimed by the Cherokee Major Cherokees. Major General Rusk called out the militia and quashed the affair that became known as the Cordova Rebellion. Cordova left for Mexico, but intimidation of the local Tejanos continued. 33 men of Mexican heritage faced treason charges in the Nagadoches and San Augustine District Courts. Only one, a former Nagadoches official, was found guilty and sentenced to hang. He even he eventually received a pardon, but Nagadoche's troubles resulted in more than a hundred Mexican families leaving the country the following year. In San Antonio, as in Nagadoche's, the old cooperative structures were crumbling with land and power rapidly shifting into Anglo hands. But despite conditions elsewhere, the Tejanos of San Antonio <clears throat> had preserved their heritage through religious practices nationalistic and religious celebrations and schooling for their children. Increasingly, Anglos paid little attention to or ignored this heritage. Some newcomers voiced suspicion of the Mexican populations and doubted their loyalty, but others acknowledged their plight. Many of the elite Tejanos in particular were caught between economic, political, and even personal ties with Anglos. As daughters of leading Tejano families, married prominent or soon to be prominent Anglo men and their Catholic, Spanish, and Mexican identity and heritage. To be sure, Seguin remained an influential figure in an, an indisputable war hero who was able to speak with authority to both the Mexican and Anglo communities. He was repeatedly elected to the Senate to the, of the Republic, where he was the only Tejano, and when he returned to San Antonio, he was elected mayor in late 1840. But as mayor, he found that every hour of the day and night, my countrymen ran to me for protection against the assaults or exactions of those adventurers. Rumor soon engulfed Seguin, who had connections with Mexico through his continued support of the Federalists there. He found himself suspected of collaborating with the Mexican government by providing information about the ill-fated Santa Fe expedition. He denied the charge and won the election as mayor, but the rumors continued. Seguin requested permission from General Vasquez, the commander of the Mexican frontier, to travel to Mexico to get some livestock, and the manner of Van Vasquez replied led to Seguin to surmise, quote, that an expedition against Texas was in preparation for the following month of March, unquote. He reported his suspicion in the Secretary of War, but without further credible information, the Secretary took no action. Seguin did not think he could defend the town without help, so his family and a number of other Tejano residents left town for outlying ranches as Anglos in San Antonio tried to set up defense. The Mex defense, the Mexican troops arrived as predicted, but occupied the town for only two days in March of 1842, then returned to Mexico. Seguin even served in one of the companies that pursued them, but when he returned, he found reports about many implausible treason were spreading widely. He heard threats daily. All the parties of volunteers en route to San Antonio declared they wanted to kill Seguin. He resigned as mayor in April and reluctantly prepared to move to Mexico to escape the constant wretchedness his family was experiencing he had become, in his own words, a foreigner in my own country. The Cherokee and Comanche experience. If Seguin had been caught up in a cultural and political crossfire in San Antonio, the same could be said of Chief Bull or Diwali, the elder leader of the Cherokee Indians in East Texas, the agent that Andrew Jackson had sent to Texas in the summer of 1836 
estimated the Indian population to be 10,000 to 15,000, with 8,000 of them mem of them members of the tribes that the United States had forcibly removed from the American Southeast, probably about 400 of them Cherokees. The Cherokees were beset by conflicting appeals to their loyalties, by faction factionalism within the tribe and by possible alliances with other Indians. During the revolution, Chief Bull at Sam Houston's urging had signed a treaty with the Republic pledging loyalty to the independence movement in return for a clear land title. Now after the war, Lamar and others had scuttled the treaty and the Cherokees had faced, Cherokees faced increased suspicion and hostility from their Anglo neighbors. They still had no title to the land they had cultivated since before Austin's colonists had arrived in Texas. In addition, Mexican agents continued to grow, sow discord in Texas, attempting to recruit the Cherokees and other Indians in their efforts to disrupt the new government. And some of the Chief Bull's young warriors had grown imp impatient and were re ready to listen. Indian policy was at the head of Houston's agenda for several reasons. One was the attack of some 500 to 700 Caddo. Comanche, Kuwa, and Kichai Indians on Fort Parker, a private fort near the headwaters of the Navasota Navis River. In May of 1836, five men were killed and two women and three children taken captive. One of the children, Rachel Plummer, would later write vividly about her captivity in a book published in Houston in 1838, while another of them, Cynthia Ann Parker, would make her life with the Comanches, later giving birth to the last chief of the Quahati Comanches, Quana Parker, now settlers pushing onto the Indian lands, ex exasperated the situation Houston tried to reach out to the Cherokees by marking the boundaries of the land they claimed. But even as the surveyors finished their work, General Rusk led the Texas militia through the Cherokees' reign region and in a show of force. Lamar's election to the presidency had effectively sealed the Cherokees' fate for Lamar and many other frontiersmen. Indians were either hostile or potentially hostile nuances to be removed without com compunction by whatever means necessary. He would later sum up his view to the Fourth Congress of the Republic. The white man and the red man cannot dwell in harmony together. Nature forbids it. The great photographer of Indian S. Indian Edward S. Car Curtis would later characterize the Texas policy as go elsewhere or be exterminated. The tragic end um, to the Cherokee Cherokees in Texas came in July 1839 when Lamar sent Rusk at the head of 500 troops to remove the Cherokees from Republic Rusk informed the Cherokees that they would be paid for their improvements and their crops, but they would have to remove the gun locks from their weapons and the militia would escort them from public. Uh, rather than subject themselves to this indignity, the Indians left on their own, closely pursued by the militia. On July 16th, near the site of present day Tyler, the militia caught up with the Cherokees and allied Delaware, Shawnees, and Kickapoos, the elder, ch elderly Chief Bull was shot and killed, and the Indians scattered, some to Arkansas, some to Mexico, and others to various tribal groups. <clears throat> Land speculators, including, <coughs> excuse me, Burleson and Burnett, quickly claimed the Cherokee lands, and Burleson crassly sent Chief Bull's tricorn hat to Houston, who was then serving as a member of Congress representing San Augustine District. The Cherokee's fate vividly demonstrates the limits of opportunity in Texas for those who were perceived as a threat or nu nuisance. 
my members of the dominant culture. The Comanches who perceived the surveyor's compass as the thing that steals the land posed a much larger threat and the campaign against them was even more costly. The worst incident occurred ironically when the southernmost band of the Comanches and the Pinatacas buffeted, buffeted by a smallpox epidemic and fights with, with the Cheyenne and Aparhao, Arapaho to the north and the Texas Rangers to the east sent messengers to request a peace council. Widely thought to be the least warlike band among the Comanches, the Pinatacas agreed to come to San Antonio with their white captives in March 1840 and brought their women and children with them as a sign of their peaceful intentions. But they only brought one cat white captive, Matilda Lockhart, who, according to diarist and San Antonio resident Mary Maverick, had been utterly degraded. The Comanches said that Matilda was the only white captive they held, that the others were held by different bands over whom they had no control. But Matilda told the Texans that Indians still held several more. Once the chiefs had gathered in the council room of the local jail, the Texans informed them that because they had not brought all the white their white captives, they were to be held hostage while the warriors returned to their camp to get the others. Soldiers filed into the room to back up their threat and chaos ensued. The troopers opened fire and a dozen chief fell, chiefs fell in the council room. At least 18 men, three women, and two children were killed outside. The Texians sent one woman back to the Comanche camp to explain that the remaining women and children were being held to exchange for the remaining Anglo captives. A few captives were exchanged over the next few months, but the massacre at the council house would not be forgotten. Comanche honor required that the dead be avenged and all war ensued that the pen Tecas went into New Mexico and as far north as Bent's Fort. The in what is today Southern Colorado in the search of the allies and weapons and in August Buffalo Hump, the highest surviving Pan Panateca chief led an estimated 500 Comanches and Kiowas in a vengeful raid into South Texas all the way to the Gulf. Although such encouragement was probably not needed, Mexican agents among Mexican agents among the Indians probably incited violence as well, accompanied by a number of women to gather up and kill the plunder. The raiders passed through the Guadalupe Valley wrecking havoc as they went. They hit Victoria on August 6th. Then two days later, they arrived in Linville on Lavaca Bay. Their citizens sought safety in a steamboat anchored in the bay or rowed out to sea in their own boats from where they watched as the as the indians looted the warehouse pulling gloves umbrellas top hats and coats from recently delivered goods intended for san antonio shops they set the town on fire and retired across nearby bayou and camped for the night the next morning wearing top coats and hats and waving umbrellas they began to their retreat Weighted down by hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of goods and more than 3,000 horses, an immense treasure for the nomadic Indians, help was not long in arriving. A group of hastily assembled settlers attacked the raiders as they left Linville. But the warriors formed a rear guard as the women fled with the booty. The Texans could gain no ground on them because their, the Indians frequently changed the two fresh mounts. Finally, San Jacinto veteran Ben, ben McCullough went ahead to Lockhart and assembled another group of volunteers. They ambushed the Comanches on Plunk Creek, 
a tributary of the San Marcos rivers near Lockhart, killing perhaps as many as 80 warriors. The defeat of the Pen Penatacas was completed that fall when was complete in that fall when another ranger group attacked their camp on the upper Colorado, killing another 50 or so warriors. Lamar's campaign against the Comanches had momentarily settled the frontier, but it ensured amenity between the two peoples for decades to come and at a cost of 80, oh, I'm sorry, of 2.5 million had greatly increased the debt of the fledging, fledgling nation. In his second term, as president, Houston tried to restore peace to the frontier in 1844. His representatives negotiated a treaty with the Caddo and the Tonkawa Indians and a number of their allies who, what is today, Waco. The Treaty of the Tehacano Creek declared that tomahawk shall be buried and no more blood appear in the path. Between the whites and the Indians, it did not specify a boundary line between the new nations but the de facto boundary became the string of trading houses of the Texians had established on the middle Brazos and lower San Saba rivers and at Com the Comanche peak where the Indians could buy and sell goods and obtain blacksmith services to repair their guns. The Comanches later came to an agreement because they had found a new source for their plunder the ranches of northern Mexico, the Texans even gave Comanche raiding parties passports so they could travel unmolested through Texas on their way to Mexico. But the grievances on both sides endured, especially as settlers continued to push westward into territory that the Comanches considered theirs, and Houston remained convinced that the only annexation to the United States would solve the Republic's frontier problem. The quest for annexation succeeds. <clears throat> 1841 to 1845. Houston's return for, uh, to the presidency in 1841 again brought the issue of annexation to the fore of Lamar's campaign against the Indians had been costly and Dr. A Ashville Smith, the Texas minister in Paris, deplored the ill-advised expeditions against Mexico that he said, have done our national standing infinite harm. The Republic was sinking even deeper into economic stress with the government debts spiraling and vast amounts of virtually worthless paper money from, te from the Texas Treasury in circulation. Nor could the Republic's leader effectively develop trade and settlement or protect the citizenry. Dr. Jones had lamented to his diary that the personal am animosity between Houston and Lamar had reached the point that General Houston, I fear, does not care how completely Lamar LR run, ruins the country so that he, he can say, I told you so. There is nobody but old Sam after all, unquote. Enthusiasm for an independent Texas was waning and the influx of thousands of newcomers for most of from the American South had even lessened the use of Texian to identify residents of the region Texan was being used more frequently. Thus Houston again quietly began to build support for Texas annexation to the United States. The real issue behind US rejection of Texas annexation was surely slavery, which had been a divisive use issue since the inception of the American Republic and the acquisition of the Louisiana Purchase Territory in 1803 kept the issue current. Neither President Thomas Jefferson nor the U.S. Congress had made any stipulations regarding slavery in the vast <clears throat> tract of land west of the Mississippi, and when Missouri, one of the first areas in the region be, to be settled by U.S. immigrants, immigrants applied for admission to the Union as a slave state in 1819, much bitter wrangling ensured, ensued. 
Proponents of slavery and aggressive expansion of the slave system, mostly in the Lower South, debated the abolitionist, mostly in the North, and those with more tentative or limited proposals in the middle, mostly in the Upper South. These different views reflected different economic and political re realities and visions pitting the North with its growing emphasis on free labor, industrialization, and republicanism against the Lower South with its burgeoning cotton economy, supported by a large enslaved workforce and defined by old pet patronalistic models of privilege and responsibility, the Missouri Compromise that ultimately emerged in 1820 preserved a balance between slave and free states for the moment by admitting Missouri as a slave state at the same time that Maine was admitted as a free state. The compromise further stipulated that slavery would not be permitted in the Louisiana territory north of Missouri's southern boundary, with the exception of Missouri. At that at the time, it seemed like a solution, but in fact, it only postponed re resolution of the dilemma. Changing climate for annexation. <clears throat> Houston effectively courted the British and they were eager to talk. 41-year-old Captain Charles Elliott, a veteran diplomat and member of a prominent family, arrived in 1842 as the British charged affairs, eager to build a viable commercial trade with the Texas to arrest U.S. westward expansion in the Southwest. Elliott was also an abolitionist and hoped indirectly at least to exert some influence over slavery and tariff issues. He soon became acquainted with the Republic's leading figures and integrate, ingratiated himself into Galveston society with elegant dinner parties, which he used to lobby ag actively against Texas annexation, pointedly ignoring American diplomats. Houston worked through Elliot and the British minister in Mexico City to try to gain release of the Texas prisoners captured in the cross borders battle. Houston Gambit worked and a worried president, John Tyler, who shared Southern attitudes on slavery, reopened communication with Houston on the subject of annexation. Houston def deftly played American authorities off against the British and James Pick Pickney Henderson, whom Houston had sent to Washington, D.C. to assist Texas charged affairs, Isaac Van Zandt, in the negotiations supported in February 1844. All things prove now the very great desire of the U.S. to annex us in an effort to influence opinion in the United States. The Tyler administration ha began a propaganda campaign to convince the public that the British were playing a dangerous game in Texas that could lead to the emancipation of Texas slaves that the darling policy of England that would in turn destabilize, destabilize the institution of the, in the South. Finally, former President Jackson came out in favor of the re-annexation of Texas, had long claimed that Texas should, be, should have been included as part of the Louisiana Purchase. With the annexation, the struggles over Texas identity seemed to recede into the past and new state officials busily worked to bring Texas into the federal system. Two prominent leaders of the revolution and the Republic, Thomas Jefferson Rusk and Sam Houston headed to Washington DC as the first US senators from Texas. Conclusion, the Republic period was essential in defining Texas identity Governor Peter H. Bell would later claim that the days of the Republic were the days of our glory, deeds of devoted, devoted patriotism and daring chivalry were then performed, which would have graced the heroic pages of Greece and Rome. But the difficulties of maintaining an independent Republic, much less trying to build an extended empire, had proved more than formidable. In the near decade of the in independence, 
The fledgling nation had fallen deeply into debt and remained in an uncertain frontier plagued by external threats and internal divisions. So most Texans were glad to become a part of the United States and San Augustine. Red Lander seemed to speak for them in when it's, it headlined glorious news, Texas annexed welcome intelligence. But as a harbinger of the of events to come, Texas naturally aligned itself with the other states that championed slavery, for it was a state in which cotton remained king and slavery was increasingly to be defended at all costs. This is the end of chapter seven, part two. Thank you.